Good day, grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in rates of reaction. In this lesson, we're going to finish going through the theory on rates and reaction. And then what I want to do is I actually want to go through a whole bunch of old exam paper questions because really the best way for you guys to get to grips with this theory is to do a whole bunch of old exam paper questions. And I'd like to stress again that the best way for you guys to prepare for an exam is to study your theory and then go do exam papers. And then from those exam papers, you can identify what you do and don't know. Go study that, make sure you understand it, or think that, make sure that you think, if, if you think you understand it, go back again, do more exam paper questions, and follow that loop around every time. And every time you identify something you don't know, you go back, you study it again, etc., etc., etc. And you just keep doing that, I guarantee by the end of the year, you will do really, really well. Okay, so let's get started with this. So we were talking about how to measure reaction rates and we spoke about the fact that there were different ways. The one way to measure the rate is to measure the rate at which the gas volume is produced, which we said was quantitative. And remember we said that quantitative was numbers, numeric. Okay, Ooh. I just put a new <laughs> nib in my pen, it's quite interesting. Okay, the turbidity is the rate of the rate at which precipitation is formed that's the fancy word for rate of precipitation form turbidity and that's qualitative color uh, change of color is qualitative as well and then the change of mass the reaction is again quantitative and we're going to talk about these specifically so yesterday we spoke about this gas syringe and about the fact that when you measure the rate at which the gas volume is produced you end up with a graph that looks like this where initially you end up you're going to start initially you'll have quite a steep gradient because you've got lots of reactants um, and so what will happen is the reaction will be very fast then as the reaction slows down, the gradient decreases with time, okay, and then slowly, finally, you get to a point where the reaction, reaction has run to completion. I'm sorry, I will get used to this new nib. It's just a bit longer than the previous one, so it's quite weird for me. So the reaction has run to completion. Okay, now we're going to look at turbidity. Now remember turbidity is the rate at which precipitation is formed. So a typical example is the one here where they're doing an experiment, you are looking at it from the top, and I think they're adding sodium thiosulfate to sodium hydroxide to something. Yeah, to an acid, hydrochloric acid. And you will see that there is an X formed initially, and after a while, the X disappears. And then we'll talk some more about it. So let's just look at this video. Yeah, they're adding the second ingredient, and he started his stopwatch. Okay. And he is now shaking it a little bit just to help it get going, just adding a little bit of kinetic energy. And remember why we do that? Because kinetic energy is going to increase the in the thermal energy, okay, which will then speed up the reaction. Um, and slowly but surely, you should see that the cross is starting to disappear. And there you go, you can start seeing the cross disappearing. Um, he's actually refocused to try and make sure that you can see it. And there it starts to disappear and it's gone. So now you can see the time and you can see what the problem is with this, okay? I said and then it's gone, but you, some of you might go, no, no, I can still see it, okay? So it also, it, when we say it is a qualitative measurement, we, and now they're zooming into times by four to seven, show you that it's really gone, they're not just messing with you. Okay, so the problem with this is that it is a qualitative measurement, okay? What, does mean, what do we mean by qualitative? We mean that, it is dependent on our observation. It is dependent on our observation, which is slightly, it is, no matter how, no matter how we try and be um, objective about it, it is slightly subjective. Because as you watch the video, like I said, I, I said, okay, let's just watch again, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, if you're watching it, and let's get to about over here. Okay, so we're looking at, we're seeing, yes, yes, okay, cross, 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 cross. Okay, and then we get a little bit more of a cross, and then, he shakes it again. Now, at this point, you can see it's definitely disappearing. Okay. 
And I would say that it has gone about, ooh, what happened? Oh, I hate it when it does that. Okay, right, let's try to write over there. I would say it is gone about now, okay? But somebody else might think that it's gone a little bit before or a little bit after. And then on top of that, we have to obviously quick the timer, so, or watch the timer. So it is unfortunately a qualitative measurement. Another example of a qualitative measurement is the change of color. So in some reactions, there's a change of color, which tells us that the reaction is occurring. For example, if we do a titration. So the faster the color change, the faster the reaction rate. So another example is ethanoic acid is, is titrated with sodium hydroxide and phenylthaline is the indicator. And phenylthaline is a pink indicator. So we've got a little video here. We again, I've just taken a portion of it so you can see. They've set up a titration. I thought I took a portion of it. Let's have a look at it. I don't think it's very long. Okay. So this wonderful company, this Russian company made this video for us. Okay, so you've got your sodium hydroxide, this is your ethanoic acid and your phenylethylene. This is a titration setup if you haven't already seen it. Okay, they put in the diluted acetic acid. Oh, I hate it when it does that. Sorry, I will stop messing with it. Okay, so I'm not going to push anything because then otherwise it starts going to the next slide. Okay. So basically what happens is they're taking acetic acid, which is dilute ethanoic acid, and they are reacting with sodium hydroxide. So they've got an acid and a base, right? And they've got phenylthaline, that funny little bottle on the side there was phenylthaline. So they've got dilute acetic acid, they've taken the sodium hydroxide, and they are placing, I think, the sodium hydroxide into the bottom tube, yep. I mean, into the Erlenmeyer flask. That is an Erlenmeyer flask. Then they put in some phenylthaline, and you'll see it's a pinky purple color. It's beautiful. Um, it depends on how much of a base it is, and sodium hydroxide is a strong base as to how pink or purple it is. And now they're taking some acid, diluted um, acetic acid, and they are putting it in a burette. And now they add it drop by drop to the alka and watch what happens to the color. Okay, you'll see that it changes. So basically what has happened is they formed a salt. Okay, but most importantly, you could see that there was a color change. Now, when you are doing these saturations and you're doing them properly, this was just to show you the color change. You actually use the point, of which, the point at which the color changes as a measure of how much acetic acid you had to add to the sodium hydroxide to... Um, to, to be able to neutralize it. And when you guys did acids and bases, and when we do acids and bases later on, we'll, we'll go through that and we'll actually use titrations as methods to calculate the concentrations of acids, etc. So now the point is that, again, it's qualitative because the point at which I think the color has changed, the point that you think the color may have changed, exact, or gone away totally, might be slightly different. So again, it's a qualitative measurement. In other words, you can't put a number to it. Now, changes in mass, okay? If a reaction produces gas, like for over here, so here, for example, they might have calcium carbonate, okay, for example, and it might be in a container with some hydrochloric acid. And what happens is it will react and you'll end up with um, basically carbon dioxide escaping. So what happens is it allows the gas to escape, the cotton will allow the gas to escape, but not the liquid. But because there's a gas escaping, there is a change in mass, okay? And what you'll end up with is a graph like this, where there'll be a huge change in mass. There's, there's a mass loss. So this number is actually gonna go down. Okay, so this is what you started with, and at the end you might end up with, I don't know, maybe uh, 94, 0.3 grams or something, okay? So the amount of mass that is lost is actually the amount of gas that was produced, right? Because the gas escaped. So 
um, that's one of the ways that we can look at changes in rates of reaction. And guys, they do ask you this. They sometimes say to you, how can we measure our rates of reaction? How can we actually show um, the thing? Or in this example, in this question, how would you measure the rate of the reaction? Which is why I'm going through this with you. Right, so now let's talk about catalysis. Okay. A catalyst increases reaction rates by lowering the activation energy by providing an alternate path for the reaction. Okay, we spoke about this before. And remember I showed you the picture of the mountain and the tunnel, and I said they'd both get there, but the one would get there much faster than the other. Okay. A catalyst does not participate in the reaction. So I wanted to show you this because this is very important. They love asking, this is a Maxwell-Boltzmann curve again, a Maxwell-Boltzmann curve. I'm really going to have to practice writing with this new nib. Okay, all right. And Maxwell-Boltzmann curve normally looks like this, okay? This is the normal one. This is the normal one, okay? And what did it say? It said that this is, it says your probability of particle with kinetic energy, and they could either write it as probability of particle or just number of particles, okay? So what does this um, graph show you again? It shows you the number of particles and the amount of energy they have. And we can say that see that most of the particles have got an average amount of energy. Okay, most of the particles have got average. Very few particles have got very low amounts of energy. And all of these particles over here, they have an energy that's above the activation energy. And what was the activation energy again? This was the minimum energy required to have a reaction. Right, that was the minimum energy. We've done this before. Okay, but now what happens when we have a catalyst? All the catalyst does is lower the activation energy. It doesn't change this graph at all. All it does is move the activation energy down. Okay, so now all of these particles now have enough kinetic energy to have a reaction. Because remember that we said, we said from the collision theory that in order for particles to have a reaction, three things have to happen. One, they have to collide. Two, they have to have sufficient energy. And three, they have to have the correct orientation. Okay, so now we are saying that these particles, all these particles, definitely have enough energy. So all we have to do is get them colliding and colliding with other particles that have the correct orientation. Okay. So this is a potential energy versus time graph, and you guys should know this from grade 10, okay, <laughs> when you guys did your first lots of reactions, okay. So what this is, is the reaction, um, the potential energy of the reactants and products, okay. And what happens is, and this is an X, this is an endothermic graph. This is an endothermic graph, endothermic reaction. Okay, we graph for an endothermic uh, reaction. How do I know that? I know this because the heat of my products is bigger than the heat of the reactants. So I can say that delta H is always the heat of the products minus the heat of the reactants, which is in this case greater than zero. Okay, because it's bigger and therefore it's an endothermic reaction. But what's important about this is what is happening with the catalyst. So normally what would happen is you'd have your energy of the reactants. There would be activation energy required to get up to an activated complex. Now remember what is an activated complex? Okay, so if for example you had, I don't know, so your, your reaction is going to be AB plus uh, let's make that CD is going to AC plus BD. Let's say that that's our reaction, okay? So the reactants in this case would be AB plus CD, right? Your activated complex is a position where all of them are broken up. So there's A plus B plus C plus D. At this point, if there's not enough energy, 
okay, they're going to go back to being reactants, okay? Whereas if we have enough energy to get over this energy hump, okay, and we get to the activator complex, then we form the products, which are going to be AC plus BD, okay? And in this case, it's an endothermic reaction, which means the products have got more energy than the reactants. But now, do you see the activation energy? This is the activation energy required if you don't have a catalyst. This is the activation energy that's required if you do have a catalyst. And what's important, grade 12, is not only does it bring this down, but please understand that this time doesn't get shorter, okay? It doesn't actually get shorter. So please don't think that, okay? When we're drawing this potential versus time graph, it actually hits at this point at exactly the same amount of time. Right. Now let's talk about the effect of temperature. So again, like I said, the um, activation energy is the minimum energy required for a chemical reaction to proceed. So we've spoken about the, um, this is the normal one, and we've spoken about a catalyst. Now we need to talk about what happens if we have a temperature, okay? A difference in temperature. So let us say that, and I'm just going to help you a little bit with this. Let's pretend that this is lower temperature, higher temperature, so we need a normal one in the middle. And a lower temperature is going to be... Hmm. Okay, so this here would be your normal one, okay, and with respect to this, okay, and you'll notice this is slightly higher, okay, now what happens is, and the reason being, and I'll explain it, okay, Okay, so this is the normal. Okay, I know it's the normal here looks like the lower temperature. We have to actually draw in the normal one here. Okay, so the normal one is the one with, with room temperature, okay? If we now increase the temperature, what happens? All the particles, all the particles in the container get to have more kinetic energy. The average kinetic energy of the whole container increases, okay? So what happens is that all the energy for all the particles increases, which means that your average high temperature now moves over, okay? But what you've also got to understand is now, but well, they've left out the activation energy. Hang on, hang on, let me just put the activation energy in. So the activation energy was about over here. Okay, no, it's still there. I see what they do. I'm done. I see what they're done. So this is the activation energy. Okay, that's the activation energy. Okay. So what you can see now is that there are now way more particles above the activation energy. Do you see that? Way more particles, the red one, above the activation energy. But there are only a constant number of particles in that container, which means that this level here, this maximum number of particles that are at this temperature is going to be lower than the original. Okay? Because it's dropped because more particles are being excited on the other side. Okay, do you understand that? Whereas, if we've got a lower temperature, then we're going to have more particles on this side, okay? So, there's going to be more particles on this side, okay? So, they're going to have... Yeah. Um, so, therefore, the peak is going to be further over to the left, and you'll notice that there are fewer particles above the activation energy. Okay, everybody understand that? Right, so now when you have an endothermic reaction, um, we've spoken about endothermic reaction, and now I just want to show you the exothermic reaction. I just wanted to make sure, I know that you got taught this in grade 10, but I just wanted to make sure you remember it, okay? So you'll notice here that the reactants here are higher than the products. So this here again is your delta H, where delta H is equal to the heat of the products minus the heat of the reactants, okay? And if that's the case, we've got, this is going to be, in this case, it's going to be smaller than naught because the products is, heat of the products is lower than the heat of the reactants. Okay, so the only difference between an exothermic and an endothermic is the shape at the end in the front, okay? In other words, this could have been an exothermic, I mean, this would have been an endothermic if this had gone up here, yeah, for example. Okay.
Right, now let's do some exam paper questions because I think the only way that we are going to, um, hang on a minute, I just realized that there's a mistake here. Um, what is going on here? Hmm. Okay, uh, for some reason the one picture is covered over the other one and I don't know why that has happened. So we will carry on, but we won't do this question. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, it says, Sarah wants to investigate the rate at which a reaction proceeds and places a beaker containing dilute nitric acid on a sensitive balance in a fume cupboard. She drops a few pieces of copper metal into the beaker. The mass readings of the beaker and the contents are recorded every 15 seconds. Sure, it's pretty impressive. From the moment the copper metal is dropped into the acid until there's no more copper metal present. Okay, so here's your dilute nitric acid, there's a copper, here's your starting mass, and then there we go, there she's measured the mass of the beaker and the contents all the way down. And then she's actually taken it and she's added them up. So she's gone, this is the decrease in mass. You can see that the total decrease in mass is 6.3 grams. Okay. Now it says the reaction that occurs is represented by the following equation. Cu plus 4HNO3. That's copper plus nitric acid. It gives you copper nitrate plus nitric oxide plus water. So the gas that's being given off is your NO. Okay, nitrogen oxide. Okay. It says, give a reason why the mass of the beacon contents decreases. Well, because there's a gas being given off. Okay. And guys, this is a very nice exam paper question that was in one of the exam papers. So this is the reason I'm going through these with you is because they are very nice exam paper questions. Okay. Then it says, use the values in the table and calculate the average rate in grams per second for the whole 150 seconds of the reaction. Okay, well they kind of helped you a lot here because do you see that there's 150 seconds and we know the total mass loss is 6.3. So therefore the average rate in grams per second is going to be 6.3 over 150 because that's grams per second. So then all we need to do is get out our calculators and we need to go 6.3 divided by 150 equals 0.042. So that's going to be 0.042 grams per second. Sure, okay. And then also, guys, I would always check, okay, this says decrease of mass in grams and they want the average rate in grams per second. So always make sure these units are the same. Just now that this has been kilograms and they want it in grams or whatever. Okay, so please be careful of that. Okay, now it says you got the decrease in mass versus time. So you can see that the mass uh, decrease in mass gets very fast, quickly, 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 and then it slows down. Do you agree that this could be the same graph is almost saying uh, the amount of gas produced. Okay, initially there's going to be lots of gas produced and then there's going to be none. Okay, it says give a reason for the shape from 105 to 120 seconds. So from 105 seconds about here to 120 seconds there's no change and the reason for that is because I actually told you until there's no more copper present the reaction and this is what you need to write, the reaction has run to completion. The reaction has run to completion. And I need you guys to be very careful about this because I know we can, when we do chemical equilibria, I know that when you get to the parallel bits of the reactions, you immediately go, oh, reactions reach dynamic equilibrium. Ta-da! I know my answers. I'm wonderful. Okay, yes, that's true if this was a dynamic equilibrium reaction. However, all the copper metal is gone. You're not going to get it back. It has become copper nitrate, nitric oxide is left the building. You cannot return this back to copper. It's not a dynamic equilibrium. It's not a chemical equilibrium equation. It's not even a chemical equilibrium reaction. It is a straight reaction. The reaction is run to completion. You've run out of copper. The copper's all been used up. Okay. 
Now it says give a reason why the rate of reaction increases from 0 to 30 seconds. So the reason it increases is because of the fact that this is the start of the reaction. So there's lots of reactants available, lots of reactants. Okay. Then it says the rate of reaction decreases between 45 to 105. Why? Because the reactants are being used up. So therefore, there are fewer reactants and they're further apart, and therefore they are going to be, the reaction is going to be slower. Now it says explain your answer in terms of the collision theory. Okay, so we have to explain our answer to this with respect to the collision theory. Okay, so as the reactants are, as the reactants are used up, okay, do you agree that the concentration has decreased? Therefore, there's less likelihood, likely, likelihood, of, wait for it, what did I say? Effective collisions per unit time. Effective collisions per unit time. Therefore, the rate of the reaction is going to decrease. And you guys can't write R of R, okay, or P dot U for per unit time, okay? You have to write it all. I'm just running out of space. Now, finally, it says calculate the mass of the copper used in this reaction. Aha, so we need to do a little bit of stoichiometry. So let's go through this, okay? So first of all, oh, I don't want black. First of all, they've given us this reaction, which is quite nice, okay? And they told us that this is the amount of grams of the NO that has been formed. Okay, so if we look at this reaction and very nicely they've balanced it for us, do you agree that one mole of copper makes four moles of NO? We don't have to worry about anything else. All that we want to know is how much copper is used. So th for that reason, we need to work out with moles, with the NO, because that's what we've got. We know that the number of moles of N number of grams of NO used is um, made is 6.3. Okay, so the first of all, we're going to go number of moles is mass over molar mass because you never work in mass when you are doing this ratio thing. You work in moles, so we work, have to work out the number of moles. So the number of moles is 6.3 over the formula mass or <laughs> relative atomic mass of nitrogen is 14 plus, plus, oxygen is 16, so therefore it's 6,3 over 30, so we need to get out our calculator. So that becomes 6,3 divided by 30, and that becomes 0 0,21. So the number of moles is 0 0,21. So that is the number of moles of nitric oxide or nitrogen oxide that was formed, okay? But now, do you see it's in a ratio of 1 to 4? Which means we need to divide this by 4 to find the number of moles of copper. So therefore, the number of moles of Cu is going to be 0, 0, 5. Don't worry about the rest, okay? Because it becomes 0, 2, okay? Um, so then, what do we have to do now? Now we need to find the molar mass of copper and you need to find it on your periodic table i'm pretty sure it's 63.5 and it is so it's actually 63.45 but we're going to use 63.5 so number of moles again is mass over molar mass this time we want the mass so we're going to go number of moles times by the molar mass is equal to the mass the mass so therefore, the number of moles is 0, 0,05 times the molar mass of copper, which is 63,5. And what do we end up with? We end up with a calculator. 0, 0.05 0, 0, 
times 63.5 equals 3 comma 1 8 okay 3 comma 1 8 grams so there you go we used 3 comma 1 8 grams of copper in this reaction okay not too bad hey okay so it was quite a nice question because there was quite a lot of um, just basic theory and then there was that stoichiometry question and guys you really need to go through your stoichiometry I know that it's weird because you do it in grade 10 and then you don't ever do it again or well, you did a little bit but not much you must make sure that you know how to do it okay right let's look at another equation and again it's your let me just see if there's another type of yeah, I think let's go through this one and then we'll go back to those just so that we have a little bit of a break from the change of mass. Although I do want to go through this graph one with you, but let's just, oopsie, okay, fine. So let's go through this question because we've only got 10 minutes and then I'll go back, okay? So it says, learn is use a reaction of sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid to investigate the factors which influence the rate, okay? The balanced reaction equation is sodium thiosulfate plus hydrochloric acid forms water, sulfur dioxide, sodium chloride, and sulfur. Okay. A time lapse for the moment of mixing equal volumes of the two solutions until a certain degree of turbidity. So remember what turbidity was? It was when the precipitation formed, okay? Appear is taken to measure the rate of the reaction. So remember that this is a qualitative measurement, okay, qualitative. So what they have done, oh goodness, I can't write today, um, qualitative, qualitative. So what they have done is they've done that experiment qualitative with the X, okay, where basically, let me show you again, where is it? there this experiment where they have an x on the piece of paper and then they put their glass on it and they see when the x disappears so that's what they're doing with this reaction okay so now it says they took it in this case that what they did was and they measured the rate of reaction okay so in this case for experiment one the temperature is 20 degrees the concentration of the sodium thiosulfate was 0.5, concentration of hydrochloric acid was 0.5, and they say it took 40 seconds for the cross to disappear, like your, all the precipitation to form. Yeah, experiment two, time, temperature was 20 degrees Celsius, concentration was 0.9, concentration was 0.5, and this time the time took 25 seconds. Experiment three, again the temperature is 20 degrees, concentration is now 1.4 moles per decimeter cubed, Concentration of the HCl stayed the same, and the time was now 15 seconds for the cross to disappear. So the first question I ask you for investigation A is what is the dependent variable and what is the independent variable? So remember the dependent variable is the one that we measure. Okay, and what have we measured? We've measured the time. We've measured the time taken for the cross to disappear, okay? Or you could even set the rate at which the reaction occurs, but time is your dependent variable. Your independent variable is what we changed. And what did we change? We changed the concentration of the sodium thiosulfate. Okay. Um, you guys need to write the whole concentration of sodium thiosulfate out. I've just written it like this, and when you put, when any, if you ever see anything like this with square brackets around it, it means concentration of, okay. So what conclusion can be drawn from the results of investigation A? Do you see that the only thing that's changed here is the concentration has gone up? And as the concentration has gone up, what has happened to the time taken? The time taken has gone down. So we can say an increase in the concentration causes a decrease in the, oh no, sorry, decrease in the time taken Therefore, there's an increase in the rate of reaction. Okay, happy with that? Now it says, which one of the two reactants, sodium thiosulfate or HCl in experiment one of the investigation is the limiting reactant? Explain your answer. Okay, so if you look over here, you've got one mole of this reactor, two moles of this, okay? One mole of that reactor, two moles of this. And they're asking 
which is the limiting reactant? The limiting reactant is the one that is going to um, limit the result by being used up first. Okay, and do you see that the one mole of sodium thiosulfate requires two moles of HCl? So if you look over here, they've given us both 0.5 moles, the concentration is 0.5 moles, and this is concentration 0.5 moles per decimeter cubed. But since it's point decimeters cubed, we can assume that it means if there's one decimeter cubed container, then we've got 0.5 moles of this and 0.5 moles of this, right? That one mole of Na2S2O3 needs two moles of 2HCl. Okay, so which one is going to be used at first? It's going to be the HCl because 0.5 moles of this actually needs one mole of this. We need double the amount, okay? Therefore, the limit, which one of the two reactants in experiment one of the investigation is the limiting reactant? It will be the HCl and why? Because it will be used up first because one mole of sodium thiosulfate requires two moles of HCl. Okay, now let's look at investigation B. So now, the temperatures have changed. This is going 20, 30, 50. Concentration remains the same. Concentration remains the same. And let's have a look at the time. Do you see that the time has decreased? So as the temperature increased, the time decreased. In, this, in which experiment is the rate of the reaction fastest? Give a reaction for your answer. So if the reaction is to be the fastest, the time has to be the least. So the time taken is the least in experiment six. So you would say six and why? Because the time taken is the least, right? Now it says explain your observation in terms of collision theory. Okay, so basically what we're saying is that if we increase the temperature, what happens? We increase the average kinetic energy of the particles. Therefore, and remember this is twofold, not only will they be moving faster, okay, therefore they are more likely to collide, but also when they collide, they have more energy therefore more likely to have effective collisions. Okay, you get it. Remember, we did go through this. Okay, we did actually go through this. Okay, so that was a nice question. It's different. Let's go on to this one. We've got three minutes, three or four minutes. Let's go through this one. It says, actually, no, let's just go properly. Okay. So now it says, nope. I get an experiment to investigate the rate of reaction a 0.12 gram piece of magnesium ribbon was allowed to react with excess dilute hydrochloric acid. Why are they telling us about the fact that it's excess? It means it's not going to be used up, okay? At room temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. So here's your magnesium ribbon, okay? There is your dilute acid and there's your balance. It says the experiment was then repeated with the same mass of magnesium and the same volume of a hydrochloric acid, but a different concentration. So this time we've got experiment one, experiment two, mass of the um, magnesium is the same, the volume is the same, but experiment two, you can see that there is double the concentration. Yeah, the concentration 0.25, yeah, the concentration was 0.5. Okay, and here is the graph, and we'll discuss the graph when they ask us about it. It says, write down the name of the flask. Okay, it's an Erlen Meyer flask. Okay, there are a couple of things you need to learn. The one is the and my flask. The other one is the equipment for the titration. So when we go through acids and bases, I will go through that with you. Okay, for this investigation, write down the following, the independent variable. Now, remember the independent variable is what? The one that you are changing. 
And in this case, it is the concentration of the HCl. And what is a suitable hypothesis? Now remember, a hypothesis can actually be incorrect. Okay, so all it has to do is compare two variables. Okay, relate to variables. So you could say an increase in concentration will decrease the rate of the reaction, or a decrease in concentration will increase the rate of the reaction, or that change in the concentration will have no effect on the rate of reaction. The point is that you need to relate concentration with rate of reaction. Okay, and your hypothesis does not have to be correct. Okay, it just has to be state that make a statement um, relating concentration to the rate of the reaction. Okay, now it says explain very carefully why the last part of both curves A and B is horizontal. Okay, and I don't know why they say very carefully because the last part of the reaction is because the reactions have run to completion. The magnesium ribbon has been all used up. It's been changed into gas. Magnesium chloride, well, it's been dissolved. Okay, so the reason, and there's been gas given off hydrogen gas, but that's beside the point. The point is that the reason that there are horizontal parts for both curves A and B is because of the fact that the reactions have run to completion. So again, you need to use the word, the reactions have run to completion. Okay, you know what, grade 12, I'm going to call it a day. Okay, we'll do the rest of this question to on Monday, and we will do this question on Monday. And then I think we're going to go on to chemical equilibria. Yeah, we're going to go on to chemical equilibria. Have a great weekend. Cheers.